Led by lift manager Jim Daniel, the team will use a 12-ton crane to lift the almost two-ton truss into position to insert the new bearing. It's a delicate task that requires precision, care, and a lot of manpower. This is an important modification that will allow for more experiment attach points on the truss. This payload's about 4,000 pounds. We're gonna ground the seal it to the hook, but we're not gonna do any metrology. The objective is just to lift this payload about uh, 12 inches. We'll install the UTAS bearings. They go on the south side of the payload. We will do a trunnion inspection. We'll clean the trunnions, set it back down, torque the caps, and uh, restow the seal. All right, let's have a safe lift. John, up increase to two. John, up slow to four. As crews on Earth work up to three shifts a day to get equipment ready for transport, in space, fixing shuttle discovery is of the utmost importance. Uh, Houston, uh, it, do you want us to press on or we could wrap this up now? It's your call. But working and living in space comes with its own set of rules. There are things that, that happen to the human body in space. It, it's like this super accelerated test bed for the body. Uh, your bones demineralize. It's as if suddenly I was 75 years old, uh, getting aged like in some Star Trek episode where suddenly my, my bones are shedding and I'm getting osteoporosis. It happens to me right away in space. And yet, we don't understand why, and when I come back, it reverses. We don't understand the mechanism, yet here's this great laboratory where people and, and any other animals we bring up with us, we can study and maybe crack the, the causes of osteoporosis and how to treat it and how to reverse it. And if you can get up to space and do those things, you can do fundamental research that is absolutely impossible to do on the surface of the Earth. But getting the laboratories into space to carry out the experiments will require NASA's shuttles. And they are being retired in 2010 by orders of the President of the United States. They will ultimately be replaced by sophisticated spacecrafts like the automated transfer vehicle. It's a very well-proven uh, docking system that the Russians have used on the Soyuz and the Progress uh, for many years. Very reliable, good, mm. robust system, and uh, we're very happy to, uh, to have it on the ATV. And here we see the, the end of the mission, actually, of the ATV returning uh, back to Earth because it, uh, it burns up completely in the atmosphere. Huh? Yes, all the trash that you've generated uh, on orbit goes into the, uh, the ATV and we, uh, we bring it back and burn it up so that uh, the station doesn't get full of, uh, full of rubbish. So uh, the next project then is to make one of these, but that doesn't burn up so you can bring me back to Earth. The longest serving manned spacecraft in the world is the Soyuz. Three, two, one. We have ignition, we have ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of the Soyuz rocket, beginning the first expedition to the International Space Station and setting the stage for permanent human presence in space. After the Columbia shuttle disaster of 2003, the only remaining link between Earth and the space station were the Russian Soyuz and Progress rockets. Standing by for contact. We have contact confirmed. The Soyuz function was to deliver replacement crews. It was also the emergency escape vehicle for the inhabitants of the space station and only left for Earth when another came to replace it. The Soyuz partner is the unmanned Progress cargo spacecraft. For the last two and a half years, the Progress craft has delivered all of the life-giving supplies needed by the beleaguered space station. The one thing they cannot do is deliver the nodes and modules needed to complete the space station. That can only be done by NASA's shuttle. As international partners around the globe hurry to prepare the crucial hardware for the space station, astronauts Steve Robinson and Soichi Noguchi step out into the vastness of space to begin their own important task, assessing firsthand the damage to space shuttle discovery. Uh, there we go. Yeah, thermal cover is already open. Somebody already out there? <laughs> On 
August 2005, and no future mission dates can be confirmed until Space Shuttle Discovery returns to Earth. Space agencies around the world can't be certain if their equipment will ever be transported into space. With the damage on the shuttle located, it's up to astronauts Steve Robinson and Soichi Noguchi to perform vital repair work. Good view of Soichi Noguchi at the end of the Canadarm2, which is being operated by Wendy Lawrence. She is maneuvering him over to the brand new control moment gyroscope near the aft bulkhead of the uh, payload bay of Discovery. While Steve Robinson and Suichi Noguchi undertake work in the cold, dark vastness of space, fellow astronauts Thomas Ryder and Dan Tanney's office is the pool at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. Over 60 meters long and 12 meters deep, this pool takes over a month to fill and contains full-size replicas of space station components. It simulates as close to a spacewalk experience as is possible on Earth. It also gives the astronauts the opportunity to practice and rehearse difficult maintenance tasks on the replica immersed in over six million gallons of water. Uh, good morning. This morning we're going to be running the Increment 13 crew, Thomas Ryder and Dan Tanney, through uh, the 12A cleanup uh, EVA-1 task, in giving them the familiarity for those tasks. The main focus is to have them really gain as much familiarity with the umbilicals. Um, if they get anything beyond that, that's uh, all extra gravy. With the drink valve right in the middle now, it, it tucks under the valve cell, so it's, it's completely out of my way and I can still get to it. But you can tuck it back in under that valve cell. I remember I wanted to bring actually my glass. Not that my vision deteriorates, but my arms are getting too <laughs> short. <Shorter. laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Right. <laughs> Astronaut Dan Tanney trains with veteran Thomas Ryder. Thomas is scheduled to be one of the next astronauts to live and work on the space station. For every hour of walking in space, the astronauts need to do seven at the pool in Houston. TVCS all on the table there, no alarms, to impact test. Copy, no alarms. Hey, good morning, safety and hours. This is Greg, your test director. How do you remember this morning, EV1 safety, EV2? Copy, I'm going to back up. And Dan and Thomas, I would just remind you again today, make sure you use the descent line to let yourselves down. Make sure you clear your ears early and often. So once you get that out 90 degrees, you can reinsert the uh, pit pin on the lockout arm. You know, the big difference between this and working underwater in the training pool is, uh, is even though you're floating in the water, you're still weighed down by gravity in the, in the suit. But when you get to space, you are weightless and the suit is weightless. So you are, in fact, floating around like a ping pong ball in a cage inside your spacewalking suit. It's the weirdest 